good old Guelph. Not yeah. enough. Guelph doesn't get enough shout outs, I think. I, um, the fact that it ever gets shouted at all. <laughs> First off, can you just do like a really brief introduction uh, of who you are? Oh, of me. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Or you could do some. Hi. Um, Hello. Yeah, I'm Steve Portugal. I am uh, outside of just outside of San Francisco in a little coastal town. I run my own user research consulting business. I've been doing that business for 18 years and doing this work for 20 something. I don't know way back into the dark ages. I have a dog. Um, <laughs> Perfect. So one of one of the questions that I wrote down uh, actually comes up, you, you said it there, is user research. And I wanted to ask, what do you call what you do? And to whom do you call it that? And and I, I'll, I'll have that as an open question. Yeah, open-ended question, but then I'll, I'll provide you some context behind it if, if you'd like, but context is always good. I'm o- I'm always curious about so you say user research some people say design research some people just say research some people say ethnography and I note that it often depends on who you're talking to right so you and I talking you can say user research I totally understand what you mean you know maybe if you're talking to a client or or a prospect of someone who's like well someone sent me to you because we're supposed to do some research yeah. you know how do you talk about what you do like particularly to people who don't necessarily have the background. Yeah, I think maybe one aspect of privilege I have or being sheltered that I have is that um, maybe I don't talk often enough to people who don't know, well, two things, what it is and who I am. That creates a certain kind of laziness. I had experience recently where um, I was referred and I think it was like a series of, do you know someone, do you know someone? Hey, Steve, could you talk to these people? all the way back. And, uh, you know, I ended up being hired to work with them. And even in the kickoff meeting we had, or maybe the second meeting, the person that's um, my main contact, really just a really amazing uh, advocate um, and smart person who's in a non they're in like a internal corporate operations role, basically. And so they sort of introduce me or sort of tell the story as we're kicking off about, um, I was told that if we were going to build this system, we would need a UX researcher. And I didn't know what a UX researcher was. And so we're really happy to have Steve who, and and so I, it was, um, it was clearly like the language wasn't comfortable for her. And in fact, there's no, I mean, I don't know if I say there's no UX and what we're working on, then that will get somebody upset because there's always a UX, but we're not, we're not working with a team that represents sort of, what you might consider when you think about that there's no there's no design people there's no um you know software people that's just sort of process and operations people so i'm far outside of my sort of familiar peeps obviously really good practice for me to be able to uh, make a case for how i can add value you know so the nice thing was they were convinced and maybe from on high they were kind of encouraged to find someone with my skill set. And so in our conversation, we had to kind of align a little bit on on language and, you know, what was that going to look like practically? Like who we're going to talk to and what does that mean? And there's even, we just even had a moment in the middle of the project where I'd been doing these internal interviews and we're sort of getting ready to to talk about what it all meant and, and that, you know, that they proposed. So we would, let's just have a meeting and, uh, you know, and, and we can get everyone together and sift through what we learned. If I say this wrong, it's going to sound like I was kind of taking umbrage at her language. I wasn't, I didn't take umbrage at the word sift, right. but I used that as a chance to sort of say, well, you know, here's how we, we have to work on this ahead of time and we have to be intentional. We have to use these methods and here's what I want everyone to do. And it's really, it's about, um, you know, I gave the low key version of like, what analysis versus synthesis is and how we're going to pull things apart and build them up into something new. And that, you know, if you call it sift, again, I wasn't trying to be turf defensive here, but really just help her feel confident about what we're going to do 
and that sifting is kind of a that verb affords something different than what we wanted to do. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I'm really, I'm answering a different question than yours, but. No, it, that's okay. I, Cause it, it goes back to like, I think it's all related. Like how do we talk about what we're doing to other people? Yeah. And I think in a way you can look at sift and say, okay, we're, we're going in the right direction together. Right. Sifting, you know, if you think about it is probably a lot less intentional than doing analysis and synthesis where you're just maybe you're just shaking things around and hoping something comes up. Right. Let's talk about it all day. And then right. see if yeah. any conclusions. Yes. But then it's a, it's not her responsibility to know these terms. Right. And, and so sift then becomes your cue to say, okay, so let's sort of scaffold this conversation to get her and and the team or whoever is involved from this, I don't know, more ethereal, unstructured approach to no, there's actually like a real method behind this that really delivers results if we follow this method of this process or however you you communicate that. And so it's always curious to me about how how people explain what they do because I've seen, you know, you probably didn't <laughs> I know you didn't, you didn't say, hey, we don't call it sifting. Come on. But I've been in, in rooms where I've seen people who are a little bit newer in their career who are very much, you know, no, that's not correct. You know, this is this is how we how we do things, how we approach things. And we call things very specific things. You know, ethnography is different from contextual inquiry, you know, and yeah, I, I feel like anyway, it's just it's really more of a, a curiosity about like how you approach yeah. it. So uh, I. Uh... I'm often, one of the things that I do is uh, teach in-house teams, I mean, basically how to talk to people and learn from them. You know, maybe we call it interviewing users. Mm-hmm. That's usually with the sort of pain that they're approaching me with or the challenge. Uh, it's, I'm really excited that over the last, even just six months, it's more product teams that are reaching out to me saying, we need to, we're talking to our customers, we need to do a better job. Uh, it's not sort of UX or even researchers that are trying to drive that change internally. It's product leadership that sees this as an opportunity. So I'm meeting different kinds of people uh, than maybe I've met before. And so I know I have this workshop and, and, and right at the beginning, I say, I try to address this thing that you're, you're asking. And I say, uh, yeah. slide says, what do we mean by research anyway? And it lists a bunch of things that you just said, ethnography, contextual inquiry, video ethnography, site visits, blah, 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 blah. And then I put up, um, I put up uh, just a big splash on top of it. It says, whatever. Like, <laughs> yeah, and my right. point is, to, like, is that it's not possible to resolve this issue of labels. And, and for me, it's not possible. And it's also not germane. Like there's a different conversation to be had. And then I try to offer a, a much more wordy and kind of reflective, uh, you know, a slide kind of breaks down. Um, you know, we do something with people, hopefully in their own context. It's like a Michael Pollan, but but much more verbose. We do something with people. I don't know what it is in their context. We look at what they do and we also learn what it means is sort of the first part. And then we infer, interpret, synthesize. We find patterns that didn't exist before. And then we apply it to some kind of business problem. Right. So try to tell a longer, wordier thing that's like, this is the thing that we're talking about doing here. And, you know, even if in this workshop, we sort of follow one thread, if you were to do usability testing, it's different than if you're going to go talk to somebody in their workplace. So we can't talk about everything about everything, mm-hmm. but at least you kind of think about the space of what, like learning from people, interpreting things, and then, you know, solving a problem with that. So I just try to provide a different, I guess a meta definition and stay away from kind of try to the jargon part of it. We, when we engage with people, whether we're in house or doing consulting or contract work, I think one of the things we're taught, hopefully we're taught is to try and get the people who are creating the products and services to use less jargon. Certainly if it isn't in, isn't germane to the people who are using said products and services. Obviously you get into healthcare, you're probably not going to hold as fast to that because they're very specific meanings to things in, in certain industries. Within our own profession, 
I feel like we we jargonize a lot. And and I don't know what drives that, whether it's the we're supposed to be like, well, you know, I know what contextual inquiry means and I'm going to use that as to to prove my knowledge. But I find that when I'm talking to people about this stuff who don't know about it, if I can abstract as much as possible and use, you know, to your point, a lot more words, it takes a little bit longer to explain, but you're imparting a lot more meaning to them. I think that's a lot more more valuable and I wish more people would would take that approach. So yeah, it's it's a, just always curious to me about how like how you think about it, how other people think about it and how they approach that as well with with their clients or even their the people that they work with on a product team or a project team or or whatever. So do you find that the product teams that are reaching out to you is that being driven by product managers or above that saying you know, we want a larger group of you doing better at this if it's like the VP of product or, or something like that. Where, right. where are those requests coming from? They're coming from product leadership. So whether that's, you know, a head of product or a VP of product or, yes. you know, even. It's funny because to me, in my little bubble, I think, oh, these people are new. They're just new to me personally. Uh, and that everyone that I meet in product is like, is, you know, we've been doing this for a long time. We just haven't paid attention to best practices. We haven't developed it as a, as a thing. You know, I'm just seeing like the product conferences and kind of the kind of people that are in the, in that community as sort of thought leaders, if we can say that word sincerely, you know, people that are teachers and advocates are super hungry for this stuff and are kind of just supporting a broader dialogue. And that's, that's looping me into it. When you get down to the team level, is that, do you find the desire there as well? Uh, yeah. Is it, or is it a, a bit more of a, or to what extent is it a challenge to get a team on board? You know, if the, if the top down is saying, Hey, do this yeah. the team, how do they react to, to you coming in and, and helping them with that? I mean, I think we like to craft uh, sort of stories of kind of passive or, or or active. I guess it's it's the passive and the active resistance. And there's passive resistance, active resistance, like where someone just says like, "Well, I'm not doing that," or "I think you're stupid." And that's not usually what you see. You don't sort of see yeah. that kind of thing happening. So you know, depending on how I engage with an organization, I'm going to see more or less of something else. If there's like a training and people are encouraged to come, you know, there might be a person that sits quietly. That person could be checked out or they could just be a quiet attendee. I don't necessarily know that there's a problem or if there is a problem, you know, I need a, I need a more sustained relationship with someone that I'm then. So I have different kinds of relationships then, you know, training is not going to give you a sense of where people are, are right, resistant. Right. I mean, if you're going to show up to the class, almost anybody that comes is, I can't say it always happens, but for the most part, people that show up to like spend half a day or a day are, are excited. They right. want to learn and they see this as an opportunity. And, you know, I'm really, I'm always just so, I guess, pleasantly surprised. Mm. Maybe I shouldn't be surprised if it's the consistent thing, but you know, I, I think so what, where there's reluctance or lack of engagement sometimes is just naivete as opposed to, I don't believe in this. And sometimes that they look, they're the same, right? They, they feel the same. So sometimes you're sort of hearing, and this happened to me the other day. It's, it's again, it's not exactly what you're talking about, but I was spending the day with an organization and I was doing just a mix of things. So it's not someone that I, I hadn't really worked with them before. I was meeting people, a lot of them for the first time. And I gave a talk and then we did kind of a workshop that was very interactive. It wasn't really teaching, but at the end of it, sort of a, one of those we're done and then out of the blue question comes up that's like really important, but we're done. And someone is saying, you know, when I go out to, we were talking about planning research. But then this person who was not even, I think, a, I don't think they were a designer or a researcher, but they were, you know, what I said, when I go out to talk to people, I have to sort of reteach myself how to not ask uh, leading questions. Right. Like the phrase leading questions is sort of the, like, that's a tell that that's the fear that someone who is not experienced, that's how they express their discomfort and not knowing how to do this properly. Because I don't think researchers or anybody that has a certain amount of experience, we never talk about that. 
It's just sort of the outsider's view of what the inside looks like. So he brings this up and he says, um, yeah, I go and I just, I Google and I find some Medium articles and I sort of reteach myself how to do it. We were like, you know, at the, at the, literally at the end of the workshop. So I was not going to, well, in our remaining time, right. let me condense. You were putting your coat on and be like, uh, my flight. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but you know, there is, there's an established research group at this organization. So I thought, thought, well, let me kind of, you know, give a shout out to them. So I sort of asked the question for the group, like, you know, for people that are in the research group, what resources have you already assembled, right? Because if this is not an, even a new research practice, it's quite large and it's distributed across different sites. This must have come up over and over again. They must have their internal document on their network that just is written up in their language that says uh, beginner's guide to, I don't know, something about asking questions. Right, right. So I, 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 that must exist, I assumed, given the sort of history of this company. So I kind of tried to like, hey, can anybody who knows what the resource that you would use is kind of help out this guy here? I got sort of crickets and then someone took my request as a, an invitation to explain how to do an interview in an open-ended way. Again, it, thing is over. She's like, when I do an interview, I try to do it this way. I mean, as Did we're trying to pause and say, is anyone writing this down? <laughs> right. Well, that would have been more, right. that would have been better than just, it, it's, yeah. it's barely tribal knowledge. So I don't know if it exists or not in that organization. Anyway, uh, as we're sort of wrapping up, so, someone had told me like, oh, we have your books here, Steve. So I just, I found out physically in the building where they were and I told him, go find interviewing users, my book. It's on the fifth floor in the library. And I sort of sent him with, I, I don't know. I mean, if you, I guess Googling to find out a best practice is fine. It just seemed a little ad hoc and I wanted him to feel more intentional and purposeful about this. Right. Um, and that that wasn't being provided to him internally. So that's not, that's not resistance. That's sort of, that's inertia, right? There you've got someone that kind of wants to do it better, but it doesn't seem like anybody's kind of getting together and saying like, hey, here's best practices. We're going to empower you or I'm going to empower myself. I'm going to share it. I'm going to write this down, like you said. Anyway, I think those are sort of, like that's what I worry about more is sort of the ad hocness of it versus the, I don't need to talk to users because I know everything. I, I hear that very rarely and I hear the former sort of scattered, well-intentioned, but sort of bumbling. That's the area that I want to help companies get better at. Mm -hmm. I think the, the, the active resistance stuff is becoming ex increasingly uncool and, you know, yeah. I think it's being phased out, but the knowing what we're doing part is also not, not very accessible yet. Well, I think about what you were just talking about, the, the person who asked the question, I really feel out uh, what we do are a set of skills and skills are things that need to be practiced. And if you don't practice them, you get out of practice. So I know that there are times when I haven't, it might've been a while since I've done a usability test or something like that. And I'm always really grateful that for me, I have this practice of basically testing the test before I go and do it with actual people. I do, you know, the, uh, hey, do you have a pulse? Could you help me out? Invariably, I will ask a very leading question just because it's like, it's conversational. You know, I'm not, maybe it's partly because I'm not doing it quote unquote for real yet, but then I'm like, okay, right, right. I have to think about that. And I'm going to get there much faster because I have the experience doing it than someone who, who doesn't. So, you know, good on that guy for trying to inform himself, right? But, but you're right. To me, it kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier about the outside of our profession. We try and de-jargonize inside of our profession. We typically don't. We painting with a broad brusher. And, and similarly, it feels like, and may, maybe it's changing, but it feels like there's sort of a a knowledge hoarding that happens. And I don't know, I don't, I don't believe it's intentional at all, but it's, well, we're the researchers, you're the X, Y, and Z. We'll take care of this stuff. You take care of your stuff. And I, you know, I've, I've been on research trips where we've 
we've uh, had like the back end developer along because they wanted to know. You know, later when we were going through the the data, the developer was like, "Oh, what if we did this for the app?" And we just sat there, looked at him, and we're like, "That's a really good idea." He was thinking in terms of this is going to be easier for me to build on the back end. You know, if the if the back end is simpler than the inputs are simpler. So, and that was back in 2007, 2006, something like that. And that's where I was like, oh, everybody should come on research, you know, to a point, obviously we don't want to go into someone's home with 33 people. And, <laughs> but I, I guess where I'm, where I'm going with that is, is like uh, the, the need to bring as many people into the practice as possible. I think is really, really core to what we do. And I don't see a lot of people doing that maybe as much as they should. To your point that they didn't even have that stuff written down, right? Yeah. Um, because it didn't occur to them that someone else might want to help or or be in, maybe it's a, a product manager who's going out and, and talking to customers about, so what features do you want, you know? Or a business analyst who is going out and and reaching out to customers or a technical account manager who's out in the field with maybe a sales rep and they're talking to customers, not just demoing the latest features, but they're uh, eliciting feedback on things where a researcher wouldn't be with them. I mean, it'd be great if they were, but to be able to get those people aligned with, here's just some, some basic how to talk to people without leading them to the answer that you hope they come to. I would, I would just, I would love to see a lot more of that. So fix that, Steve. Sure. <laughs> I'm, old, I'm old enough to remember when you know, <laughs> talking to a customer or a user was unique, you know, maybe exciting and maybe a rare opportunity. I mean, what I find ironic is that, you know, we've been asking for more research, more, more people talking to people, more, more, more as that has happened it's less of a, it's more of a commodity because it's less of a unique thing. So the more commoditized it gets, the less, the less you can involve people because I mean, uh, like this idea of have, uh, setting up uh, uh, every Friday we have users come in and we show them something, whatever it's going to be like those kinds of programs. I mean, that's making it as sort of, I mean, that's fully operationalizing it and, and making it part of the infrastructure of, of, of the process. Mm -hmm. But it also doesn't make it like, ooh, we're gonna show our work to somebody and get feedback. Like it, and so some of the some of the thrill is gone, I guess. That that maybe would motivate people to I don't know, rearrange their schedule or you know prioritize this. Mm -hmm. I mean, where, where you're making it and like a real event. Yes, an event uh, is a great way to put yeah. it. Yeah, as opposed to it's just a meeting or something. You know that. Yeah happens every Friday or every other Friday. And... Yeah, because it's certainly not just a meeting for those participants, right? I mean, yeah. so we, the more we operationalize it then commodify it, then the less, that seems like a, a side effect of, of a good thing, like more research that involves more people, that involves more part of the pro more parts of the process. That's, yeah. So, I mean, it's fun, like it's fun working with this internal operations company because, or, or uh, department, because this is not a thing that they do. Right. So there's, there's a little bit of a, I don't know if this is power or ego or influence or something like I can frame what I'm doing as something that's a little bit different, not to get, you know, pats on the back, but to get their attention and their, hopefully get them to reflect on what they're hearing and how it's different than where they started. I think right. the more you commodify it, the more, the less you're engaged as an, or as a culture, and the less you are, yeah, like ready for reframes or ready for, you know, default assumptions challenged. Again, I, I prefer it the way that it is now when there's just more of it that obviously is better for everybody. But yeah, you can't, you know, you can't have an event every Friday that's like a unique opportunity that's not. Then I think about the product folks, for example, who are, to me, newly hungry. Again, it may have been historically like that, but that desire to get this information to do it better and to kind of build based on it, that drive that they had, I can just sort of feed into that. I can, I can give them these things. Right. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're excited to, to be incorporating that as they go. And yeah. Yeah. As opposed to it just being, Oh, it's this, this thing we're doing. Yeah. 
right? Where it's a, just a yeah, box that you check off or you get you get your qual, right. you know, something like that that just just sucks all the, the joy out of it. Right. Yeah. So when you are doing the workshops or are you mostly doing I'll, I'll say broadly training these days, or are you also doing research, research? Yeah, I'm doing, it's a mix. It's a mix of research, research. Yeah. Which is the new name of it. Research, research, yes. <laughs> yeah. research, research, and research training. Yeah. It's a, it's a mix. I get involved with, you know, an organization for weeks, if not months, or I get involved with them like for a day to kind of come in and kind of help here and there. So to what extent in, in all the work that you're currently doing, does improv still play a role for you? Mm. Do you, do you consciously think about that? Do you use, because you've, you've written about uh, improv and you've given talks about how to use the games of improv to elicit. Yeah. yeah. There's not, there's probably not a, a session. I'm hitting you with some old school stuff again. So. Yeah, it was good. Uh, right. I mean, I first started writing with that in like 2003, I think I did a first uh, workshop on improv and I, I mean, I still, I still use that and I still do it. I, I mean, you know, improv, uh, you can boil it down to this idea of yes. And you say yes to something and you add something to it. And I mentioned that as a principle, like anytime I'm sort of standing up in front of a group, I have slides about it. So it's a little bit of sort of improv flavor. Uh, when I'm teaching people about doing brainstorming, I talk to them about coming up with bad ideas in order to build on them. Mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to trying to like make everything the right thing. You know, I think I approach any kind of facilitation activity as improv. I just had this experience maybe two weeks ago. It was the, it was the first interview in a study mm -hmm. and my client wrote the interview guide and it's pretty, it's pretty good. It, I mean, I, I, I help them punch it up, but it's, you know, how do you do this in your work? What tools do you use? How do you do this in your work? What tools do you use? How do you do this? It's like, it's like, here's all the things we want to learn about. And so in my head, I'm kind of getting ready to talk to this first person. And I'm like, that's the scene that I have in my head. I'm just going to ask him about all this stuff. It's pretty clear. Yeah. Guy walks into the room that we're meeting in. He just starts talking, like even sort of starting the interview. He just starts talking about like very openly about like his life and his history and kind of how he got to the point. Mm -hmm. It was cool. He actually started to cover some of these things. And I, I could kind of go in and like, you know, ask a little follow-up, ask a little follow-up. But I had this idea, like I was in control of the interview. And then of course what happened was, right. yeah. how am I going to have this conversation with this real person, right? Here's a real person that has their experiences and I have to integrate my set of inquiry into their structure. So like totally an improvisational game, right? All these kind of constraints on it, you know, at, I think it worked out fine and we kind of were able to cover what we needed to cover that was sort of relevant for him. But yeah, it's kind of like you're saying about that, you know, first usability test thing, you sort of find yourself doing things. So I don't think I messed it up. I think I did a good job at it, but it was that, that realization that you just keep having over and over again. Like every time you do this, like, Oh yeah, like I, this is about responding to what's happening in the moment, not sort of, writing a script on top of some person and it was sort of this visceral feeling of like oh I, like it got the challenge got thrown back at me i had an idea of how i was going to handle it and then i realized i had to rely on improvisation and say yes to him and right. ask him about the tools he used and ask him about that yeah it was challenging i was sort of it was challenging and fun in a good way and i felt good afterwards but it was like oh yeah whew, that was not <laughs> what i thought was going to happen right uh, you know. Yeah, Matt, Matt and I had a, a project together a couple months ago, and we interviewed 20, 22 people or so. Uh, and it was all this kind of interview where it was all remote halfway through. So we had, you know, a discussion guide and, and all this stuff and things we were trying to ask people probably halfway through, we got on a call with a participant. And I said, Hi, my name is Matthew. And I'm and he said, Look, I know what you guys are trying to do and I'm going to tell you how it's going to work. And I was like, okay, this is how this conversation is going. And it wasn't so much like a discussion guide out the window, but 
discussion guide is like informing this conversation at best. It's definitely not driving the conversation because this person has like walked into this meeting angry mm. because, and and at that point, I don't know why, like, well, I don't understand why he's angry, but I need to let him yell at me in a way, not to be rude. He wasn't being rude to me, but, and, and get that stuff out of the way so we can get to the conversation that we need to have. But also, you know, if he needs to vent for 10 minutes, let it go, let, let him, let him talk. And, and having that flexibility of, of not having to, uh, to come back to the participant and say, well, you know, bullet point number two here says that you're supposed to be listening to me right now. So one moment, please. Yeah. And I, I guess it kind of goes back to that whole, we put together these plans. I, I always feel like we put a lot of work into these plans and we go out and we do the research and it's like, well, we use probably about 25% of that plan because it went where it went, you know? Yeah. Um, and I think that's a good thing. So I'm not sure the extent to which we should be planning. Maybe we should just, not that we should be winging it, but right. I, that, think, yeah. I think the planning helps you be improvisational or helps yeah, you. Yeah, right. Well. Exactly. But you're, you're talking, I mean, what you described uh, is, I think a whole other level, like that's a superpower you're describing because it's not just the interview didn't go where I thought it was going to go. It's, there was a lot of emotional energy. And uh, so you had to, you had to sort of, you know, let that blow past you. You had to do a lot more of handling of yourself, of your own expectations mm -hmm. to, I mean, to deal with someone that, someone that wants to talk about something else is one thing, but someone that has issues and is concerned, like I, I, uh, I had this happen this week. Again, some, sometimes the logistics are out of my hands. This was supposed to be in person, ended up being over the phone, and they didn't know that they were going to be recorded, and they were going to ask to sign something. So I didn't have a way to ask them to sign, which basically I let the form say what we're doing, what they can expect, and, 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 and so on. So I just had to say at the beginning of the call, like, or I chose to just ask them, is it all right if we record? Because I thought a whole disclaimer is just going to get in the way. So I just, I just kind of winged it and he got really upset. Sometimes people will ask you a couple of questions, but he was mad. He was kind of spitting nails at us, even said, you know, if this and this happens, I will sue you. Like he was really mad and we ended up in a good place afterwards. Like he was, he was right. Like he was right. I understood. I, I, he was right to be sort of incensed and surprised and given his context, which he kind of revealed, he's super sensitive to a lot of things. So we kind of triggered him. And he, he settled down, like he settled down because we listened to him and we talked to him and we sort of yep. did all things. Yeah. Like you said, I mean, you know, the person that you allowed to vent, but I think that that's like sort of an extra researcher thing. I don't even, I don't know that we teach that. I've been with researchers in the field and had people be very kind of egotistical and talking about what they've accomplished. And right, I was showing like a paper a stack of papers that was kind of a whole scenario. I think they like grabbed it from me and like went through and just started critiquing it. Like you said, I guess this is going to be the interview. And I thought it was awesome because, you know, it was just unfiltered and so clear. And this guy had a story about himself and he wanted us to know what it is. And mm -hmm. if he, in another context, I might say that guy is an egomaniac, but that's not how it felt to me. It was like really good, clear. I'm telling you, Steve, what you have to do. Like, that's what I wanted. But my colleague afterwards was just kind of rolling her eyes and like didn't like the way he was acting and sort of felt, I guess, judgmental of him. But it was interesting to just, you know, that's the fun thing about doing research with somebody else is just see what bothers them and what doesn't bother you um, and kind of where they're coming from. And you're like, wait, should that bother me? Yeah. <laughs> It's not something I don't want to, yeah. I don't want to have that interaction in, in my social life, but yeah. you know, in a field setting, like I have nothing to complain about. He, yeah. so he told us about which president he met and which, what's, you know, Ivy leagues, his son was going to good. Like I want people to tell me things they're excited about and proud about, like, and I will, I'll welcome and support that. So I you're, just, you're going out there and interrupting their life and, but you still want them to be a real person you're not looking for them to be like, all right, could you write down the 33 steps you go through for this task, please? So that I right. can 
that. And thank you very much. Like, and if they may have to perform a little bit to do that. I mean, you're going to hear how great I am and you're going to hear how well I've accomplished all this stuff. And you're going to hear this and like, Right. You can't get to like what's wrong until you hear about what's right. And sometimes you still can't get to what's wrong because their whole narrative is about what's right. right. Which, by the way, is an insight about how we are going to go about changing how this work gets done. Exactly. Uh, how the need is perceived. So it's all, it's all grist for the mill, I guess. But anyway, I just liked your story about not being bothered by that person's... Oh, yeah, Absolutely. Story. I, it was definitely a surprise in the moment, like when it initially was starting. So it, it wasn't like I was totally chill about it from the get go. But within the first minute, I was like, okay, this is the conversation we're having. If we don't get to the question six, seven or eight or whatever. That's fine. You know, we'll, we'll get to where we go. And that's kind of why I wanted to talk about the improv stuff, because it's, it's something that's really at the top of my mind of late. I've, been taking some improv classes again from the last time I did it 30 years ago. And I'm thinking about just how much I wish it was standard training for all researchers to do, you know, improv 101, basically how to listen to people, how to adjust, how not to drive things and how to, how to, it's really, it's co-creation, right? That's kind of where I was going with that, but we don't have much time left. So I want to give you, so I have one final question for you. And this may be a softball. It may throw you for a loop, but uh, what's your next book about? Uh, <laughs> my next book's about leading questions. Like uh, what's your next book about? Uh, uh, definitely interested in creating stuff to share with people. I mean, you know, I have my own podcast, Dollars to Donuts, shout out, interviews with people who lead user research in their organization. But I don't know that I... I don't know that I want to write a book as the next thing that I do. Yeah. There's just different formats. And so what's, yeah. what kinds of outcomes get created? Like a, I've written two books as pretty, both were challenging experiences and extremely rewarding. Does writing a third book, does the effort sort of create the kinds of outcomes for my own career versus, yeah. you know, writing, uh, uh, writing more or, speaking more or not doing any of those things. I mean, the, the fun thing is, you know, about a podcast is you get to bring other people in. So right. Right, my podcast is about uh, highlighting what work other people are doing. So I'm learning from it. I'm also uh, able to yeah show off people that don't have the platform that I do. Yeah. I mean, I'm learning a ton from, from the interviews that I've done and I guess yeah, someone even wrote me the other day and said, oh, you should write a book about the podcast or you should do a talk. And uh, I did one sort of like the the talk you do when you're not sure what you have to say about the thing that you're working on. I've sort of done that talk. I don't know. I don't know. The long answer is I don't know sort of what the, I mean, I'm focused on the podcast right now because that's just where my energy is and it sort of fits into my consulting life right. uh, as yeah. kind of a, one activity in that but does that ladder up to something else i, I don't know i, I it's yeah, fun it, to try it, to... it was more of a, a that prompting question of going back to the beginning of this conversation where you know instead of saying contextual inquiry we talk a bit more about it so instead of the book what's exciting you to share with people and what's getting yeah. keeping you interested in what you're doing and it sounds like right now that's your podcast, Dollars to Donuts. Right. And that yeah. podcast is about some of the things we're talking about, right? How do, because so much of research leadership is happening inside organizations, you know, versus back in the day when it was in agencies or, you know, external consultants, there's just a lot to examine there, I think, around, you know, building these practices, building up, uh, you know, dealing with the people with fewer skills that are kind of coming in and have less experience. Mm -hmm. So I have been doing some talks have been writing about that stuff you know maybe it's just sort of stepping back and looking at where the research practice or industry whatever you want to call it is you know at this point where we've been what's unresolved i'm sort of interested in those things that's maybe adjacent to the podcast but you know a lot of the work that i have done has been about hey here's a practical way to get better at your skills like that's what the workshops some of them are about and so i'm i'm interested in like talking with researchers specifically there's now enough of us that we can have our own channels our own content our own gatherings and talk about 
the specific things without being under the umbrella of UX and just have research be a thing. Yeah. There's a lot to talk about and, and lots of people are kind of contributing to those dialogues. So I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm interested in, in that right now. You know, we've, we've talked about these things, right? As research grows, it changes. Different people are, you know, people are doing it that are not, quote, researchers. It creates a lot of interesting challenges and opportunities and it's shifting very rapidly but you know what are we not addressing what's kind of what's kind of left out there i think you know the 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 convenience uh to do things remotely like you know we're doing it's led to certain kinds of compromises and then that changes what's being produced and then it you know, if commodification is something we want to resist, then setting up eight Zoom calls in a day and then asking people a bunch of questions over crappy video connections, that doesn't make, that that supports commodification. And if you are so overtasked that you're hiring people with almost no experience and not giving them any mentorship or supervision, just sending them off to to be junior researchers without a, without any any support, and they're doing Zoom calls and kind of asking leading questions, you know, rapidly, then, then research stays as kind of a, or it reverts back to a support function that's very tactical, not a leadership function that kind of drives innovation. So there's all these sort of tactical factors that are all kind of integrating in each other. And, and by no means do I have a say, here's how we should solve it. I guess I'm just trying to observe it and analyze and synthesis and kind of synthesize and present it back and say like, here's the, here are the choices that we are making collectively, us as a profession and the people that engage with us. I mean, I'm, I'm very much hand-waving right now since you said this was the last question. Um, yeah, yeah. This, this is sort of where my thinking is at, to sort of look at the field right now and sort of look for symbols and signs about, you know, where we're, you know, making progress or what's kind of, you know, holding us back or sending us back into like a previous era. Mm -hmm. And, and just either call attention to it or, you know, invite people to yeah, think about iterating or improving. In that. All right. Well, I've been uh, a terrible host and run you right up to your, your next meeting. So I apologize for that. I will let you go. All right. Well, thanks. But that, that last little bit was like, I really was interested in that. So, uh, so thank you for, for sharing that part. Cause I'm, that's the things that I'm really curious about as well. Great. Um, thank you for chatting with me. Thank you. It's a great conversation. It's good to talk to you. Later.